uh, our topic is about the Bible. Okay, uh, I was once a relativist. You know what a relativist is? Re or the word relativism? Anybody who knows? Nobody? A relativist uh, believes in this manner, that all religions lead to God. Okay, all religions lead to God, that all beliefs are essentially the same and they are only superficially different. But they are all essentially the same and they will all lead to heaven. That's what I believed in before. I believe that Buddhism, Hinduism, and all those isms all, are all equal and can lead you to heaven. That's what I believe in. Okay? But what changed? But what changed me? It is the Word of God. The Word of God in two ways. The Word of God is Jesus, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was... God. So the Word of God is Jesus. So Jesus, the Word of God, changed me through His written Word. Written Word is what you call now the, the Bible. Okay? So what is in the Bible? Why do we adhere? Or why do we believe in the Bible? What is in it? In it is God, right? It is the story of God. It is where we find His character, his attributes, his person, and how we can relate to him, how we can have a proper relationship with him. And the Bible is the final authority in all matters of faith, conduct, and character. So we believe in the reliability of the Bible. Okay, why do we believe in the Bible? The first one is because there's unity of the Bible, or there's unity in the Bible. Do you believe that there's unity and diversity in the Creator? Is there? According to Ra how, how many of you have been to the conference last week? Dr. Ravi Zacharias, Unshakable. Very good. According to Dr. Ravi Zacharias, there is uni both unity and diversity in the Creator. Because there are three persons, Okay, distinct, and then, but there's only one God. Does the, does the principle or does the doctrine of the Trinity violate the law of non-contradiction? Does it? It doesn't. The law of non-contradiction applies when both are contradictory. For instance, if I claim that God is one being and three beings at the same time, that would be contradictory, right? Because I claim that He's three beings and one being at the same time. But since God is one being, on one hand, or one essence, and three persons on the other, there's no contradiction, right? One God, three persons. Unity, diversity. If there's unity and diversity in the Creator, there's unity and diversity in His creation, right? Family, diversity, father, mother, children. But there's unity, one family, right? So same with the Bible. How many books are there in the Bible? 66. How many are in the New Testament? 27. In the Old Testament? 39. So 66 books all in all. But how many were the authors? About 40 of them, right? Different authors. Some were shepherds. Some were kings. Some were fishermen. Different backgrounds. Different walks of life. Different countries. It was written in different countries. In Europe, in Asia, in Africa. Different literary genres. There are psalms, there are proverbs, there are narrations, narratives. There's diversity in the Bible, right? There's diversity. But there's also unity. Because God, uh, there's this only one storyline beginning from Genesis all the way to Revelation. It is the story of how God redeems humankind. Okay? There's unity. So again, there's unity and diversity in the Creator. There's also unity and diversity in the Bible. So we believe that despite the fact that the Bible has diversity, it is still unified. Okay? Are we clear on that? The second one, is fulfillment of prophecies. What is your favorite prophecy? Is it about 
that kingdom of Tyre? Is it about Israel? The fulfillment of which is, uh, came from, uh, it originated from Ezekiel 36 and 37, and then now Israel is a nation, right? 1948. But my favorite is the one, the fulfillment of the, uh, the prophecies about the Messiah. There are about over uh, 100 prophecies about the Messiah, or nearly 200. For instance, the Messiah is born of a woman, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. He is of the line of Abraham, Genesis 12, verse 1 to 3. He is of the tribe of Judah, or through the tribe of Judah, Genesis 49, 10. He is a son or descendant of David, 2 Samuel 7, verse 12 to 13. He is born of a virgin, Isaiah 7, verse 14. He is crucified and suffered, Isaiah 53. And he will rise again, Psalm 16, 10. Are these all fulfilled in Jesus Christ? What amazing thing about prophecy is that the Bible keeps on repeating clear things about the distant future, but they are all fulfilled in Jesus, right? All the way from Genesis, see? Genesis 3.15, born of a woman. Isaiah, born of a virgin, seven, hundreds of years before Christ came. How amazing the Bible is, right? Don't you find it amazing? I find it really amazing. The Bible is really an amazing book. Fulfillment of prophecies. Jesus in John 2 verse 19 said, Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. What happened? He rose again on the third day, right? Based on Matthew 28, John chapter 20, and all other gospel accounts. And the resurrection is the best documented event in the entire history. Okay, I could talk about the resurrection for hours, but we don't have time. It's actually my favorite topic. Again, why do we believe in the Bible? Because of the accuracy of the Bible. <clears throat> why is the Bible accurate? How many of you have read the uh, books of Aristotle or Socrates? Anybody? Comics na lang yata, binabasa natin, ha? Or telenovela, we watch telenovela. We no longer watch, uh, read the classics. Do you know how many manuscripts the books of Aristotle and Plato and Socrates are? How many? Only a handful. And the span of time between the time that they were written up to the time that they were uh, published, it took so many years. How about the Bible? The New Testament alone contains how many? Do you have an idea? More than 24,000 manuscripts. The New Testament alone. You see, the scribes were very aware of what their task is in copying these manuscripts. They knew that it was sacred. They knew that they were privileged people. So they took care of copying the manuscripts word for word, letter for letter, okay? So that if they even make a single mistake or error, they would destroy the shit that they are going through and do it all over again. That's how accurate the manuscripts are. Some, someone even said that if the Bibles of today were born, all of them were destroyed, we can still make copies of them directly from the manuscripts because they are very accurate. So the Bible is unified. There's unity in the Bible. There's fulfillment of prophecies. And the Bible is accurate. The, second, uh, the next one is indestructibility of the Bible. Is God indestructible? Could you destroy God? 
In the same manner, the Bible is also indestructible because it is His Word. Are you familiar with the verse, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8? The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of God stands forever. There were many leaders who tried to destroy the Bible. There were many governments who tried to discredit it. But look, the Bible is still here. It's in your notes, right? Voltaire, who is a French, uh, he's a French writing. He said that within 100 years of his lifetime, the Bible would be destroyed. It would be out of circulation. But look, 50 years later, right? The Geneva Bible Society has used his house and printing press to print stacks and stacks of Bibles. So the Bible is indestructible. You cannot destroy the Lord. You cannot destroy His Word. Second, the last one is the transforming power of the Bible. Again, how many of you are here last week during the Unshakable Conference? Have you heard of the testimony of Pastor Danny or Kiko? What a wonderful testimony, right? And then you also see testimonies of people in the pulpit. Week after week or sometimes month after month. You see the changing power of the Bible. I mentioned you er to you earlier that I was once a relativist. I believe that all religions go, will lead us to heaven. Is that correct? Are all religions true? All religions cannot be true, right? Because they teach the opposite thing. Christianity teaches that salvation is by way of grace through faith in the person of Jesus Christ. How about the rest? They teach works, right? They teach works. So how can opposites be true? Truth, according to, again, to our Dr. Ravi Zacharias, is exclusive. This cannot be a mic that I'm holding and a chair at the same time. Right? Truth, therefore, is ex exclusive. It, Jesus claimed to be the truth, the way, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. Then all religions could not be the same. Okay? So God cannot exist and not exist at the same time, right? So there's the fallacy of being a relativist. And that would also be useful if you would talk to your relativistic friends later on. So the transforming power of the Bible. May I read to you Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12? It says here, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So that's how powerful the Bible is. Then, then the next one is, why should we follow the Bible? If the Bible is true, should we follow it? If the Bible is authentic, should we follow it? You follow your leaders, right? How much more should we follow our master, Jesus Christ? Is Jesus Christ a master worth following? Yes, he is. Then his word must be worth reading. How many of you have read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation? So therefore, for those who have not yet read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, this is my challenge to you. Read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. It only takes how many minutes, guys? Those for those of you who have read. How many minutes? About 20. 20 to 30 minutes a day to read through the Bible. So why follow the Bible? The Bible gives us guidance and direction. What were the Ten Commandments for? Could we get saved through the law? 
Uh, I normally ask this question no, with regard to, uh, let's go back to a little bit to salvation to just to prove my point. How were the Old Testament people saved? By? By? Obedience to the law. Any objections? Any other answer? How about the New Testament people? How are they saved? So the Old Testament people were saved by law. The New Testament people are saved by grace. How about us today? By grace. So by grace, by grace, pero by law, yung Old Testament people. When Jesus claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me, does that contradict what you earlier said? That the Old Testament people were saved through? They were also saved through grace because they were looking forward to the Messiah, right? Well, then us today, we are looking backward. It's the same. When Jesus claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life, is the same. That's how the Bible gives us direction. See? Even salvation. See? It's the same. It cannot be different. There's no difference. God cannot contradict Himself. Am I correct? So therefore, the Bible gives us clear guidance and direction. Okay, can we all read this? Psalms 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Do you know that God works His best miracles in the darkness? What is the, the first instance where God did His greatest miracle in the darkness? Where is it in the, in the Bible? Do you remember? It's in creation, right? And God said light, and there was light. Next one. In the New Testament, the next one. Where is it? Where can it be found? Where? Okay, but it's actually in the incarnation. Where the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Because it was, God made uh, uh, the Word was made flesh in the darkness of the womb of the Virgin Mary. You see, God creates His greatest miracles in the darkness. The third one, it's in the crucifixion. Because it says there between, it says there in the third to the ninth hour, I think, it was dark. So the greatest miracle there is what? The substitution. And the, finally, what's the greatest miracle in John's Gospel? In the, fin in the final chapters. The resurrection. Because while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. That is why the Lord creates His greatest miracles in the darkness. In the darkness of your doubts, in the darkness of your depression, God works His way. That's why your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. If you have any false doctrines that you carry in your mind, that you have in your heart, the word of God changes it, enlightens us. And secondly, it equips believers for victorious Christian living. Is the Christian life, as Pastor Peter would always say in the pulpit, is the Christian life hard to do? He even says it is impossible, right? Because you cannot live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit. In Galatians 5.16, it is said, Walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So it is only through the work of the Holy Spirit, that we are able to achieve a victorious Christian living. And it is through His Word that we know this. That's why in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, can we all read this? All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, 
and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In other versions, it says all scripture is inspired by God or God breathed. To say. So it is useful for teaching. So again, the doctrine of salvation, we are saved by grace through faith in the person of Jesus Christ. It teaches us the correct doctrine. It teaches us the gospel. It teaches us how to live rightly with God, to have a right relationship with the Lord. It is also useful for rebuking because it exposes the false doctrines that you have with you. And once they are exposed, the false doctrines that are with you, it is also useful for correcting. Once they're exposed, the Bible helps in correcting us in our false beliefs, in our false doctrines. You see, aside from being a relativistic person, I was also an animist. I believe in spirits, in the occult, but God changed me through His Word. But of course, it was slow. I used to believe in superstition. Do you? I did. I, I, I looked at horoscopes <laughs> in TV. They're horoscopes, right? So it is useful for correcting this false belief. And then it's also useful for training. Are we done when we are saved? Is it finished? Is God's work finished in you when you have been saved? No. You are a work in progress. You are a work in progress. And the objective of God is to have Christ-likeness in you. Christ-likeness. So how to learn God's word? It is through Bible reading. Okay, how many of you read the Bible every single day? Yes, so many hands. So for those of you, again, who do not read your Bible every day, please do read the Bible. Okay, in Deuteronomy 17, 18 to 19, can we read this together? When he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law taken from that of the priests who are Levites. It is to be with him and he is to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and to follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees. What is the purpose of writing? <coughs> During worship services, do you guys write what the pastors uh, say? I do write. I have a notebook. What is the purpose of that? Yes, I have I've heard two, to remember. Yes, to remember it well. And then, here, take note. It is to be with him and he is to read it all the days of his life. All the days of his life. Are you familiar with Joshua chapter 1, verse 8? Can you go to it? It says here, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. It only says there all the days of his life, but here, day and night. Why? So that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. See? Day and night, not only reading, but also meditating on God's Word. Day and night. That's how important it is. And the next one is through personal Bible study. How many of you do, do Bible studies here in your D groups? Okay. We read Ezra chapter 7, verse 9 to 10. He had begun his journey from Babylon on the first day of the first month, and he arrived in Jerusalem. On the first day of the fifth month, for the gracious hand of God, of his hand of his God was on him. For Ezra had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord 
and to teaching is decrease and loss in Israel. So how many of you have devoted yourselves to Bible study, just like Ezra? Because the gracious hand of the Lord was upon him. How many of you guys? Only a few. There are many kanina. <laughs> and now a few. So we end with this. The obedience-based Bible study method. How many of you have heard of this? OBBS. Let me say just a few words about this now. OBBS. Obedience-based Bible study method. Okay, you pick a verse. Okay. For instance, I'll pick a verse. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. Be angry, but yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. You put it in one column. You do write this, okay? You copy God's word, Ephesians 4.26, on one column. And then on the next column is your own words. Okay, this is mine. Okay, I, it's all right to be angry so long as you do not let your anger control you. And do not go to bed with an anger, with anger in your heart. Okay? Th those are my own words. Okay? So that's what you're going to do on the second column. And on the third column, you do the application. Okay? For instance, number one, before I get angry, I will count to ten every time that happens. Would that be a good application of that? I will count to ten. Okay? Or every single day, I would have to read for about 10 minutes verses about anger for the next two weeks. There's a criteria there in your handouts, which your uh, session uh, or D-group leader would be, or a breakout leader would be explaining to you, okay? So this is where we end our session. So we end with a prayer. Is that okay? Uh, Lord God, we thank you, Lord, for bringing us here safe and sound, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your, for your message. Thank you, Lord, for giving us your word, Lord, because your word gives us light. It enlightens us, Lord. It removes our doubt. It gives us instruction. It gives us the right way to live with you, Lord. Lord, may your message for today sink deep in our hearts, Lord, so that we may be able to apply it in our everyday living. Lord, we commit to you the rest of the day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.